uh, what do we do again? Usually record to the computer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we're going to start some new stuff. Like we're, we're totally moving in a different direction and effectively we're going to restart and then we're going to reintegrate in a couple of weeks. Sort of the stuff that we did in the first part of the year with the stuff that uh, we're going to start doing now. Uh, so historically, there were kind of two different fields of calculus. There was integral calculus and differential calculus. So we've seen differential calculus. Uh, that's the stuff that we were learning last year with derivatives and, and rates of change and these sorts of things. And then there was integral calculus. And integral calculus is really concerned with finding the area under a curve. So in fact, let's write that down. Let's kind of, uh, you know, just state what are our objectives? So what's our goal? Just very broadly, right? We'll kind of like formally, uh, you stupid pen. We'll uh, very broadly state this and then, you know, we'll do it more formally later. I think I've forgotten how to write because it's been so long. Okay, so uh, our goal is, you know, given a function, and my pen is not helping. Are you, what is going on? Okay, give me a second. But basically given a function, uh, let's say on a closed and bounded interval, so, you know, the closed interval a, b or something like that, we're gonna graph that function, and then we wanna find the area under the graph, okay, the signed area. And I'll explain what signed means in a second. Okay, so given a function, let's say from AB to R, right? We want to find the signed area beneath the graph. of f. Okay, so I'm going to draw a picture here, try and give you an idea, including what I mean by like signed area. Okay, so maybe here's y equals f of x. All right, here's a here, here's b here. So our goal is what we want to do is we want to find this area between the graph and the x-axis, okay? But it's going to be signed in the sense that any area which is a above the x-axis is going to have a positive weighting. So we're gonna say that this area here, oop, no, that's red. So we're gonna say that this area here, this is positive area, right? And we're gonna say that area beneath the x-axis, that's negative area. Okay, and we'll be able to talk later about how to find unsigned area, so absolute area. Um, where we consider that both of these things would be positive area. There's a fairly easy trick uh, in order to do that. And you can start thinking now about, oh, if you have the signed area, how would you get the unsigned area? Um, but that's what we're going to do, right? That's our goal. And the way that we're going to achieve that is to basically approximate the area using a shape that we're very familiar with, namely rectangles, right? So rectangles are really easy. We know how to find the areas of rectangles. And so we're going to approximate this area with rectangles. So how we're going to approximate paint the area using rectangles. And then we're going to take a limit, quote unquote. then take a limit. Okay, so maybe let me uh, draw a bit of a picture here again. Uh, I'll try and draw the same curve, roughly. So we've got something like whoop. And again, here's A, and here's B. All right, and what are our, uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut up the interval, right? So the first thing I'm gonna do is take the x-axis and slice it into chunks. Yeah, just make it a little bit more manageable. And then each of these chunks, I'm just going to try and approximate the area of the graph with a rectangle. And my approximation doesn't need to be great because I'm eventually going to take a limit. And again, I say this and go, okay, so this one's a little bit tricky because we don't know what area to take here. Let's say, you know, just as a picture diagram, maybe there's more negative area here than positive. 
do something like this, right? Your picture doesn't need to be great. So it's just, you're trying to get an idea, okay? So each of these rectangles, pretty, pretty easy to find the you know, area of a rectangle, length times width. And the idea is that if we've cut up the x-axis, well, we know what the widths are. And then uh, in order to approximate the height, we'll probably use the function itself, right? The function will give us some idea. Uh, I was kind of drawing them at, at arbitrarily. I think there were probably a couple of places where I like used the middle of the rectangle, like the midpoint of the interval. So the value of the function at the midpoint of the interval, there were probably a couple that I did. But I think, for example, this one here doesn't look like I used the midpoint, right? That one, it kind of looks like I used the left end point. Same thing with the one beside it. So I wasn't being consistent, Sultan, in, in you know, how I approximated those rectangles. I just kind of drew them arbitrarily. But actually, you kind of you bring up an important point here, which is there are a couple of things that we have to consider if this is the approach that we want to take, right? So maybe we could list that. So kind of note, there are a few concerns here, right? So one, uh, things that we have to worry about is how do we, you know, when we take an approximation, you know, what do we choose for the height of the rectangle? Right, so how do we choose the height of each rectangle? And more importantly, does it matter, right? Um, so you would suspect that it shouldn't, right? Like, let's say I use the left point, the left end point of each interval in order to figure out how high the rectangle should be. Uh, and then I take a limit, but again, we're gonna figure out what that means. But if I use the middle midpoint, the right point, or maybe a point at random, does that make a difference, right? And we have to think about that. So how do we uh, choose the height of the rectangle and does that make a difference? Right, but what about the, okay, yeah, absolutely. This is a great question as well. So the number of rectangles, so two, the number of rectangles, uh, how about the number of rectangles and also the size of the widths, right? So we've talked exactly, yeah, okay. So, and that's something we're gonna have to, you know, prove to Yang is that like, as you use more rectangles, you should get more uh, accurate. Okay, so yeah, the idea of taking infinitely many is going to be this sort of limiting process. And we're gonna, we're basically gonna have some sort of epsilon delta thing again, in order to account for the idea of, we can't actually take infinitely many rectangles, but maybe we can take an arbitrary sort of thing, right? Um, and as we get, you know, as we use like arbitrarily many rectangles, do we seem to asymptotically approach uh, a number, right? That's sort of the idea there. So how about the number of rectangles? But then also, and here's something that, that really differs, especially if you've seen this sort of thing uh, before, is there's nothing saying that the rectangles all have to be the same size. So in my picture here, I kind of drew them as though they were the same size, right? But in theory, why can't one rectangle be much fatter than another rectangle, right? And again, does that make a difference? So how about the number of rectangles or their width? Right. So ideally, what we'd like to say is that if for the area under the curve, that none of these things should matter. Right. But at the end of the day, when we take a limit, it shouldn't matter how I chose to do my approximation. I should always get the same answer. Right. So we want. So the area, maybe let's say it like this, the area should be independent of any choices we make. So the area should be independent. of any choices we make in the approximation. And so this sounds quite daunting, I think, right? Because there's a lot of things that we kind of have to worry about here. All right, so the standard way that I think that this is introduced in, you know, if you were to take 136 right now, the way that they would talk about this is they would introduce something called a Riemann sum. And in a Riemann sum, there are kind of typically three Riemann sums that you take. And, and I'll define Riemann sums for you a little bit later, but you define a Riemann sum. 
And then the typical Riemann sums you take are where you always sample the left endpoint. So you say, oh, it's a left Riemann sum if you always sample the left endpoint, a right Riemann sum if you always sample the right endpoint. And by sample, I mean, use that to figure out how high the rectangle should be, right? You use the, the right endpoint and you figure out the value of the function at the right endpoint. That's how high a rectangle you use. Uh, and sometimes you use a midpoint. And you know the great thing is too, if any of you do any coding, it's very, very easy to write a program which will do this for you. Right, like it's absolutely trivial to write a program which can numerically integrate something like this and, and compute these sorts of approximations. You imagine this would have been actually a lot of work back in the day when you were doing this by hand. It was very easy for a computer to do now. That being said, that's not the best way of doing even computational uh, integration, and I can tell you a little bit about that much later. Um, but you know, if you're interested, just try and do this. In fact, try and if you're uh, familiar with any visual software. Um, you can even try and graph this, right? And if I recall correctly, I think I wrote something. I'll try and I'll try and hunt it down a little bit later. Uh, okay, so the area should be independent. Now, like I said, so usually the way that you do this is with Riemann sums. Riemann sums are very, they turn out they're a little bit tricky to work with. And I will define them for you later, but that's not how, that's not what we want to be the definition of, uh, you know, finding area and checking if something has a, a well-defined area. So we're going to do something a little bit different. Okay, we're going to do something called Darbu sums, and it's equivalent. So for those of you who have seen some of this before, don't worry about it. It is equivalent, but I think it's easier. Okay, so we're we're actually going to take an easier approach. Um, but there's a, a couple of things that we have to do before we get there. Okay, so what we're going to do, this is sort of our idea. This is what we're trying to do. Okay, we want to compute the area, approximate using rectangles, and our approximations, whatever our area is, has to be independent of all of our approximations. Let's start formalizing that. The first thing that we're going to formalize is how many intervals we take and how big they are, right? So that's the first thing that we're going to do. Uh, and so that leads us to this definition. So if a, b is an interval, a partition P of AB is just a collection of points. Uh, now, it's we're basically going to treat them like sets, but for the purposes of our definition, I'm going to say that they're an ordered collection of points, such that the first point is A and the last point is B. Is an ordered set of points. Because normally sets aren't ordered, right? But we're going to demand that they're ordered. So it's an ordered set of points. P is equal to A, which is equal to X naught, which is less than X1, which is less than X2, which is less than dot, 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 less than Xn, which is equal to B. OK? And right now, it's kind of like weird and abstract. We'll do an example in a second to really kind of nail that home and, and what I mean by that. Uh, we'll define the order of P to be N. I don't think I'm going to use this too often. Okay, and here we have to be careful. This order here is not the same thing as its cardinality. Because if you count the number of points I wrote down, I wrote down n plus one points, right? X zero, I started counting at zero and I stopped counting at n. So that means that this set has n plus one points in it. But the order of the partition is going to just be n, not n plus one. And this is the number of sub intervals that it's going to define. Number of sub intervals. P defines. Okay, again, I'll do an example in a second. Uh, the length of P is, and we're not going to use this too much. This will come up more when we talk about Riemann sums, but not for Darbu sums. Uh, Xi minus Xi. One. Maybe let me put that in brackets. 
Okay, so the length of the partition is the size of its largest subinterval. Uh, what I'm going to do for notation reasons, okay, so notationally, there's a lot to take in here, I know. So notationally, let, so I'm going to try and draw a fancy P. That's not a very fancy P, but let PAB be the partitions, be the set of all partitions. Partitions of AB. And if P is X naught. So again, sometimes I'm going to jump between using the like X naught less than X1, less than X2, dot, 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 XN, and then just writing it as a, as a set. Um, but again, we understand that when I write this as a set, these numbers are in order. Right, sets normally aren't ordered. You can put them in any order you want, but it's a partition. So x0 is less than x1, is less than x2. So when I write that as a partition, we understand that that's true. Uh, then I'm going to say delta xi is going to be uh, xi minus xi minus 1, because this is going to come up a little bit. So delta xi is just going to be the length of the i subinterval. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, Sultan. So L of P, the length of the interval, is the 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 jump between uh, the the biggest jump between subintervals, right? In some sense, it is. You can expect it to be. So so if you think about what we're, what we're trying to do and how we're trying to approximate the area by using these rectangles. The length of the partition is, in some sense, the worst rectangle, right? It might not actually be the worst approximation, but because it's the fattest rectangle, it's the one that's likely to be the worst approximation. And so when we use the length, uh, what we're doing is we're, uh, or when we say the length of the partition, we want to know what is the worst possible approximation, basically, right? Wh which rectangle is the worst? And then that way we kind of have an upper bound on how badly things are behaving. Is the sum of the dxi the lengths of p? No, no, no. So the length of p is the biggest of the dxi's, right? So let's do an example and we can see it. So we could do something like, right? Because the, the sum of the dx delta xi's would just be b minus a, right? It would be the length of the interval. So let's take, let's say the interval is 0 to 10. Let's just make our numbers nice. And something like three, what do I want? Seven, eight, ten, something like this. Okay. So, so, <coughs> excuse me. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the interval and what you'll, again, you notice that all the numbers are in order. The first number is zero, the last number is 10. And what the three, seven, and eight are, are they're going to tell me where I'm making the cuts to do uh, smaller sub intervals, right? So, I'm going to take here's zero to 10. And let me see if I can. Okay, so this has got to be five. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so three is here. And seven, five, six, seven is here. Eight is here, right? Okay, so basically what we're saying is that this partition is going to take zero, ten and cut it into these sub intervals. Right? Let me try to draw that a little better, like that. Okay. Now, uh, so in this case, we're going to have um, what else can I draw down here? So we've got delta x1 is equal to 3, delta x2 is equal to 4, delta x3 is equal to 1, delta x4 is equal to 2. We've got that the length of the partition is going to be the maximum, right? It's, so the length of the partition is the biggest subinterval. It's the length of the biggest subinterval. So if you want, it is the biggest of the delta x's, right? So in this case, it's delta x2. And the order of p is, again, not the number of points in p, because p has five points in it, but those five points define four subintervals, right? So the, the order of p here is equal to four.
So does that make sense? Are there any questions about it? So, I mean, even though a partition is just an ordered set of points, I want you to think of it as us cutting up um, the interval, right? That's why it's, uh, it's a partition of that interval, right? We're cutting it up into smaller pieces. Okay, good. And again, you notice, so the length of this interval should be 10, right? It goes from zero to 10, so it should be 10. And if you add up all the delta xi's, you also get 10, right? Because that makes sense. If you add up the lengths of all the subintervals, well, you didn't add any intervals into zero, 10, and you didn't take any away, so the, the sum of them all should still be 10, right? Okay, so we have to define a couple more things. Why did dx start at one? Okay, yeah, so in that case, when I count intervals, I usually count, well, here, we can do it a couple of ways. So usually we start counting at one, right? So I wanna say delta x1 is the length of the first subinterval, delta x2, the second subinterval, delta x3 is the third, delta x4 is the fourth. But if again, if we look back at the definition, so delta xi is xi minus xi minus one, right? So if we started counting at zero, we get x zero minus x negative one, and there is no x negative one, right? Like we always, this one here is x zero, x one, x two, x three, and x four like that, right? So we're indexing the intervals by their right endpoint, and so the the first index uh, has to be one, right? Because the first point is x zero, and the right endpoint of the first interval is x one. Does that make sense? All right, so this does not exist. Okay, cool. All right, so an important thing that we're gonna need to talk about is refinements. So definition. So if P and Q are both partitions, let me try and draw my fancy P, we say that Q refines P or that Q is an, a refinement refinement of P if P is a subset of Q, okay? So if I give you two partitions, Q refines P if P is a subset of Q. And again, like these aren't sets because they're, again, they're ordered and normally you don't have that restriction, but we're gonna use a lot of the set notation, intersection unions, subsets, these sorts of things. And this, this shouldn't be crazy. Okay, so again, maybe uh, let's build on our example before. So we had this P here at the top of the screen, 0, 3, 7, 8, 10. And let's refine it. So example, let's just make up, let's just add some points. So uh, the partition Q is, all right, so 0, 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, 10 refines P above. Right, uh, And if we draw it in, you can see why it's called a refinement. So again, I'm just going to use the picture that I've drawn up above. So here's, you know, in yellow here, I'm going to do the partitions of Q. So these are going to be the Q. Uh, three to five, five to seven, seven to eight, eight to ten. Right? So you can see they have the same endpoints in general, but generally Q has more sub intervals inside of it, right? So it's a refinement. It, it, things have gotten finer. The, there are more sub intervals, and the sub intervals are generally smaller. Now, of course, a refinement can have the same length, right? A refinement, like if I hadn't uh, added any points between three and seven, the lengths of these uh, partitions would be the same. Um, and of course, uh, any partition can refine itself, but generally a refinement has more subintervals in it. 
Exactly, exactly. That's a great way of thinking about it. Q makes P more precise in terms of the right guidance, right? And we're going to expect that as we take an approximation, refinements are going to give us better approximations. Yep, absolutely. P is a refinement of P. In terms of this definition, we will say that P is a refinement of P. Ah, okay. Yeah, so this is a great question. Is it a refinement if they don't have the same cut points? And the answer is no, right? Um, so this is a great point. Not every two partitions can be compared. So note, right? Not all partitions can be compared, right? So for example, if we take, what did we have above? Three, seven, eight, nine, ten. And let's do another one, p hat. Let's do an easy one. It's just 0, 5, 10, something like that. Um, these, neither is a refinement of the other. Right? They just can't be compared because they don't have the same cut points. So Anika, this is a great, uh, thing to point out, right? To be a refinement, you do have to have the same cut points. It's just the refinement might have more cut points, right? Yeah. So this is this is this might be your first exposure to what's called a partially ordered set. If we order the, we can define an order on the refinements by, uh, or sorry, on the partitions by saying that p is less than or equal to q if p is a subset uh, subset equal to q, right? Uh, in which case, that gives us an order. If I give you a chain of uh, partitions, it's very possible that you know P is less than or equal to Q is less than or equal to R is less than or equal to S and so on and so forth. But it's not a totally ordered set because you can't compare every two elements of this thing. So this is what we call in mathematics, this is called a poset, stat, which stands for partially ordered set. This is called a poset, but it's actually stronger than a poset. Um, and uh, yeah, let's, I mean, we, it's not clear why it's stronger than a post set yet, but let's talk about this now. So while P and P hat here that I've written down, they can't be compared, right? Because they don't have the same cut points. Neither is a subset of the other. However, they both have a common refinement, i.e. there is a partition, which is a refinement of both of them. And what would it be? So what partition is a refinement of both P and P hats? Uh, oh no, that's the wrong way. So you actually have taken all points out, but we, I want something. So I want something uh, where P is a subset of it and P hat is a subset. Uh, not intersection, but Sultan, yeah, exactly. The, take their union, right? I, you want to take all of the cuts. So P defines a set of cuts, P hat defines a set of cuts, but if you union them together, right, then you get just all of the cuts. And now that will refine both of them, right? So let's say uh, any, Maybe that's note one, note two. So any two partitions admit a common refinement. Any two partitions, P and P hat, admit a common refinement. P union, P hat. Right. So in this case, right here, p union p hat would be what? So it'd be zero, three, five, seven, eight, nine, uh, ten. I don't think nine was in the above set. Whatever. Who cares? Um, but so there we can see this thing is you know p is a subset of this and p hat is a subset of this. Right. So this is a common refinement. And the way that you can kind of visualize it is, ah, this is hard to draw a picture of, but you've kind of got, you know, maybe you've got, uh, you know, a partition here and it's, you know, this is a refinement and, uh, you know, maybe here's another partition and then here's, it's almost like a kind of infinite tree. Right. So even though these two things, so these arrows here represent refinement, right? So as I go from left to right, I'm getting more and more refined. So while these two things can't be compared, 
comparable. They do have a common refinement, right? So there's something further in the tree where they merge. So it doesn't kind of matter. This, this is like an infinite tree going from left to right. And it doesn't matter where, if you have any two points uh, on this tree, even if there isn't a line connecting them directly, if you go far enough to the right, they'll eventually have, you know, they'll eventually those lines will come together. And this is important because what we're effectively going to be doing is limiting over this set. And this is a property that you need to be true in order to take limits over partially ordered sets. You need that eventually, no matter where you start, even if these two things can't be compared, eventually they come together and they are. And we're not gonna talk about doing limits in this sense. This is something if you go on and you do higher level math and, and more like especially abstract algebra uh, and topology, this is the sort of thing that you talked about there. This is what's called being a directed system. So a directed system is a partially ordered set in which for any two elements, they both, you know, there's an element which is further up the line that is greater than or equal to both of the elements, right? I, in that case, in our case, we would say both of these partitions have a common refinement, but that's the notion of a directed set. And when you have a directed set, you can take limits on directed sets, okay? So that's, again, we're not gonna use that language here, but that's what's going on behind the scenes, okay? Okay, sweet. So we have uh, some refinements. And now I'm going to define for you a sum. So any questions so far? Because we're about to actually start doing math. Because so far it's in, in the sense that like it's just been definitions and examples, right? We haven't had to prove anything. Very quickly here, I'm going to give us a definition. We're going to have to start proving things about it, right? So I just want to make sure everyone's okay. Everyone understands what's going on before we really start getting our hands dirty. Not too bad? OK. Can we compare the length of P? Sure. Uh, so I mean here, so the length of P here is the biggest subinterval. So this one's going to be 4. The length of P here is going to be 5. The length here is going to be what? It looks like 3. Uh, yeah. And generally you can see like there's there's no way, I think, at least kind of on first glance here, of figuring out what the length of the refinement is relative to the length of the of its components, right? Um, because in particular, when I took the union, that five, which was a whole interval in itself, suddenly cut up the interval from three to seven that we had in P, right? So it's impossible to determine what the length of a refinement will be based off of the length of uh, the things that it came from. Right, okay. Uh, generally, yes, Adam, right? So it generally, if P, and you can prove this, this, this is a great little proof if you want to just try your hand at, at some partitions. So, you know, we have a nice little hypothesis here. So if P is a subset of Q, then the length of P is, uh, what do I want to say, greater than or equal to the length of Q, right? And we have to keep it greater than or equal to, we don't know, right? Again, you could refine, but the length not change, uh, especially since P can refine itself. But in general, it should seem that as you refine more and more, the length should be generally be non-increasing, uh, right? It should be getting smaller in general. Uh, the textbook does it in a slightly different way. So my book does it slightly different. My book actually starts with Riemann sums and then does Darboux. We're going to do the opposite direction in this class. We're going to start with Darboux and then I'll show you Riemann sums. Uh, I think it's just a little bit easier. So in my book, uh, what I end up having to do is I talk about Riemann sums, then Darboux sums, I prove their equivalent. And then that way I can use whichever tool is most convenient to prove theorems. For our purposes in this class, it's easier if we just kind of choose a definition, prove as much as we can from it, and then be like, oh, hey, by the way, there are a bunch of other ways you can do this as well, right? So a lot of this stuff is present in the book, but the presentation, particular presentation is going to be a little bit different. Okay. All right. Here we go. Darbu sum. So definition. So we're going to say let F from A, B, A, B to R, be bounded. Uh, 
Okay, that's important. And we're going to let P be a partition of the partitions on AB, right? We define the lower Darbu sum. So Darbu was a French fellow, so it's spelled like that. Oh, I should, uh, let me write out what P is. You can just put this anywhere, but I just want to make it clear that we're calling the partition points x0, x1 through xn. Okay, and in particular, then the order of P is n. So this is LFP is the sum from i equals 1 to n of the infimum of f of x as x is in xi minus 1 xi times delta xi. OK? So again, that I, and I know the writing is getting a little bit small, so it might be a little bit hard to read. But what it's saying is, on the interval xi minus 1 xi, so one of the subintervals that we define using the cut, take the infimum of the function on that interval and use that as the height of the rectangle. OK, and I'll draw a picture of this in a second. OK, and the upper Darby sum, exactly the same thing, but change the inf to a soup. Like that. OK, so these are approximating rectangles. Let me draw something for you. Let's see. Uh, I'll try and draw the same thing that I've been drawing. And probably want to make this picture a little bit big. So if you're kind of taking notes as well, right? make sure you draw your picture nice and big. Uh, I do want to take too many partitions here just because it's a little bit, the picture kind of becomes hard to draw. Let's let's just do four subintervals like this. Okay, and again, you're, you just got to get close, right? Don't worry about replicating my picture exactly if you're taking notes. And then what we're going to do here, let's do the first interval really carefully uh, so that you can get the hang of it. And then based off of how I've drawn it, you can adapt it to whatever uh, figure you've drawn. So if I look at this first subinterval here, what I'm going to do, so let's do the lower Darbu sum first. I'm going to do that in red personally. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the lowest point, right? I'm going to find the infimum of the function on this subinterval. And that to me looks like that's actually kind of the left end point here. That works out kind of nicely. Or maybe let's draw that solid. And that's, that's the height of the rectangle I'm going to draw, right? Then I'm going to go to the second interval. Right. In, in fact, let me kind of draw these up here so you can see what I'm looking at. Because maybe you're not visualizing it the same as I am. So I'm looking at the function between my, my dotted red lines. And I want to say, what is the infimum of the function here? Now, the function is actually continuous, so I, I can choose the minimum. That's the same thing. What is the minimum value of the function here? Oh, that it kind of looks to be this right endpoint. So I'm going to draw that rectangle in. Right. OK. This. Now here, right, I'm looking at the function on this interval. The minimum, again, now appears to be the right endpoint of this interval. It's not always going to be the left or right endpoint. It just kind of worked out that way. And then uh, the minimum here looks to be about this, this height. OK, so that is. this red or pink or whatever this is. You would find the areas of all these rectangles. The minimum absolute value depends on what you mean. So notice here in that third rectangle, there's no absolute value, right? I'm actually taking the minimum. 
and in in like it depends what you mean because the minimum of the absolute value in that third interval would be zero do you know what i'm saying so maybe you mean absolute in a different way so yeah we just really mean the minimum value period uh well oh no you're right oh you're right you're right the minimum should be like this thank you yeah you're right Okay. And you would compute the areas of all those rectangles and you would that add them up. So the sum is obviously adding up the rectangles that in femum f of x times delta xi is the area of each of those rectangles, right? That's, that's what you're doing. And then the sum adds them all up. Let's do the same thing for the upper sum, or maybe here, let me make a little legend here or something. So this thing here, this is the lower sum. Okay, uh, I'm going to do in green the upper sum. So we're just going to do the exact same thing. Uh, I'm going to look at this first interval here. I'm going to say, what's the biggest point? Well, here it kind of it looks like it's the right endpoint, so that's kind of nice, right? I'm going to draw my stripes going the other direction, so hopefully it, you can see them both. Uh, here it looks to be about this height, like that. Here, I think it's this height. And then uh, here it's the biggest value. Uh, that's what I actually drew last time. Like that. Okay, so those are, again, hopefully you can see that, um, but the, those are the upper and lower Darby subs. And you can see immediately one of the nice things it does is it says we don't have to worry about which height we're going to choose. Um, I mean, you might still worry about if I chose an actual point, does it make a difference? Do I get a different answer than if I use the upper and lower Darbu sums? But the great thing about this is, is that there's no choice in terms of the point that you're going to choose, right? You always just choose the supremum and the infimum, and those are the heights that you use for the rectangles. So we've kind of thrown away, when we were writing those notes, we said the first thing we have to worry about is how high do I choose the rectangles? Well, there's no choice involved in that anymore. The lower and upper Darbu sums make that choice very easy. There is no choice. Always take the inf and the soup, right? If we were doing Riemann sums instead of Darbu sums, we would still have to worry about that. That's why we're not doing Riemann sums. Darbu sums make our life a little bit easier like that. Okay, so are there any questions about this? Okay. Now, one thing, uh, oh, the reason we use soup and if is that we already know some theorems about them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's another reason too, Jackie, which let me kind of point out now, and then we can kind of put that into your context as well, because you're right, we know things about the soup and the if, but then you might still make an argument that like, well, doing a Riemann sum, where instead of using the soup and if, you just choose a point in the interval and use that to be the height of the rectangle, um, that might be easier because then you don't have to use supernative theorems, right? Um, so we use that, but here's the other thing. What you hopefully, if you look at this, and again, it's a little bit hard because the picture is busy, but if you look at this, notice that the green area is for sure bigger than the area under the graph. Does everyone see that? The green area is always an over approximation. And the red is always going to be an under approximation. Right, so the the green area over approximates, and the green uh, or the green area over approximates the red area under approximates, and what we're going to do is some sort of squeeze theorem thing, where we hope that the red area comes up, the green area comes down, and then they agree on what the area of the 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 uh, under the curve should be. Um, So will we try to prove they're equal and therefore the heights aren't important? Right, so you can see generally they're not gonna be equal, but I, I don't think that's exactly what you were asking. Yeah, basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the supremum of the lower bounds. Well, okay, yeah, but we can't take infinite many sub -rect like rectangles, right? Partitions can only have finite many points inside of them. So 
the basically what we're going to do is we're going to take the supremum of the lower sums and the infimum of the upper sums. And if those two numbers are equal, that's going to be the area of the rectangle. If they're not equal, then we just say that the function is not integrable. And that's that's the word that we'll use. But yeah, there it's not that they're going to be equal, it's that in their limit, which is what you mean, I think, by the infinite one, yeah, then they're going to be equal in the limit. That's the right idea. Right? One always over approximates, one always under approximates. Do they sandwich together in the middle as we limit? If they do, the function is integrable and that number in the middle is the answer. Okay, cool. Yeah. Does each rectangle have the same width? No, they don't have to. Um, in fact, here you can see the third rectangle looks like it's a bit fatter, right, than the fourth rectangle. And partitions don't require that you use the same width. But the definition of integra integrability that we're going to use is going to be very nice in that it allows you to choose which partition you want to use. And if you're doing that, you should maybe take an equal width interval because they're the nicest things to use, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. Yeah, the partition, the width depends on the partition, yeah. Okay, and then from this, oh, here, let's do a quick example of actually computing an upper and lower Darboux sum. You can imagine there's not going to be too many situations where we actually compute an upper and lower Darboux sum, but let's, you know, let's try one. So example, so uh, what do I want to do? Let's do, and then we'll probably take a break after this. So f equals negative 1 to 2 to r. And I'm going to take the function uh, x goes to x squared, let's say. Right? Just a nice, uh, relatively simple function. Let's take our, part, our partition. Again, let's not you know, make it too hard. OK, just two subintervals there. Uh, and then let's find the upper and lower subs. Okay. And you know, there is still value in drawing pictures here. I don't think that this problem is, you know, hard enough that we really need a picture, but uh, it doesn't hurt. And some of this stuff will, you know, it will uh, help if you do have a picture, right? Uh, and then two, and then one, two, three, four. Let me just try and draw my parabola here. So it looks something like, oh, oh this is going to be a terrible drawing. I already know it. Uh, okay, there's my parabola. Okay. And again, you can almost just like based off of the picture, see what the answer is going to be. So if we draw the, let's do the lower sum first. So the lower sum on this first interval is what? Like what is the height on uh, the interval negative one to one? What is the height of the, the lower sum? So it's, of, yeah, or what is the infimum? I guess is what I'm asking. What's the infimum of the function? Uh, here. Let me just write it out in painful detail, and then I'm never going to do that again. Okay. Uh, zero. Yeah, it's absolutely zero. And just for completeness, what's delta x1 while I'm here? Like, what is the width of this uh, rectangle? Two, exactly. So it's going to be zero times two, but obviously we don't care about the zero portion, right? And then I'm going to add to that. Okay, so what is the infimum of the function on the interval one, two? One. And then what's the width of the interval? one as well, right? So we would add all this up and we would just get one out, right? And in fact, so you can't see that first rectangle because it doesn't have any height. So that's that's what the lower sum looks like, right? It's basically just that single rectangle. Again, there is kind of like a zero height rectangle over here, but it's not, it's not really doing anything, right? It's not contributing. And let's do the upper sum then. And again, I'm just gonna write it out in painful detail and then never again. So that's going to be the soup. And again, you don't need to wait for me, right? You can just fill these in if you're comfortable and you know what the answer should be. One, two times delta x2. Okay, 
So the soup on negative one to one is one. Yep. And we already know what the width of that is. Whoa, that's not a good, that's not a good drawing. All right, so that's going to be one times two, right? Because we already know that that's the width of the interval. What's the soup of? Oh yeah, see my my stupid drawing does not look very good because these should actually line up, right? They have the same height. Okay, and now the soup on one to two. It's four, right? And then we times that by one. So the, the soup here looks. Oh, how am I on? How am I on red? Looks like this one, like that. All right, so plus four times one. And so here we get six. Okay, does that make sense? Nice. Okay, so you can imagine like this one's actually a little bit trickier to do with the computer. If you're, gra so surprisingly, if you're graphing, if you do this graphically on a computer, it's actually pretty easy because the way you actually graph with a computer is you just, compute the value of the function at a bunch of points. And all you would need to do is just tell it to keep track of in each subinterval what the maximum value it computed was. If you're just uh, not graphing it and you're trying to efficiently just figure out what the max and min are, well, that's actually quite tricky, right? Um, you'll probably want to use some sort of numerical algorithm to do that. So that's one of the problems here. Uh, computing upper and lower Darboux sums with a computer is actually a little bit more tricky. And the easiest way is to just brute force it is to basically just say on the interval from one to two, compute f of x for you know 100 points in that interval and take the biggest one and hope that that's hope that that's your max. So you know it's not great with a computer, but whatever. We're not computers. We're going to do this theoretically, and they end up being a nice a nice tool. Okay. So again, uh, so we'll take a break here. What I want you to try and guess though, uh, just while we're on break, is trying to figure out what should so there. Are, yeah, what should be the correct? So I've already kind of mentioned that the area under the curve should in some sense be the supremum of the lower sums and the infimum of the upper sums. And you can take that uh, if you want. But some functions don't have a meaningful notion of area under the curve, right? For example, the Dirichlet function, the, the characteristic function of the rationals, the function that is zero at the irrationals and one at the rational numbers, that function doesn't really have a meaningful notion of area under the curve. And so what I want you to think about is how do we figure out when it even makes sense to say the uh, supremum of the lower sums and the infimum of the upper sums are going to be equal, right? Is there a way of defining that without actually saying, without actually taking the supremum of the lower sums and the infimum of the upper sums? Um, and that's going to be our notion of integrability. So see if you can figure out a way that doesn't actually require you knowing what that number is. Okay, and that's the definition of integrability. And we'll see if you can come up with that. Okay, so let's take 10 minutes here. It's basically 10.05 by my watch. So we come back at 10.15. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll carry on and I'll give you the definition of integrability. Okay, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them in the chat and I'll answer them because I'm going to go refill my coffee, but I'm around. Okay, so I'll see you all in a little bit, in 10 minutes. Begin and see where this takes us. Okay, so hopefully you've thought a little bit about what the notion of integrability should be. Um, I'm not going to go right to it because there's a couple things I want to prove first, just to like, you know, in terms of your guessing, you don't have to worry about whether it actually makes sense. You can just get an idea. I'm going to prove something which hopefully should be obvious. Not obvious. I don't want to say obvious. I don't think obvious is true, but uh, is believable, right? I don't think that what I'm about to state is uh, counter um, counterintuitive. Okay, so let's do it. And yeah, pay close attention to the partitions here because that's important. So proposition. So um, what do I want to say? So let's say let f mapping a b to R, be bounded. Okay, we always have to assume bounded. Okay, so number one, for all partitions, 
the lower sum is always less than the upper sum. Fp is less than or equal to Ufp for all p in fancy p. Right? So no matter what partition I give you, if you take the lower sum on that partition and the upper sum on the same partition, the lower sum is always less than the upper sum, less than or equal to, right? They could be equal, but it's very rare. The only time they'll ever be equal is if you're, you know, got the constant function sort of thing. Okay. Two, uh, given any two partitions, P and Q, we'll have that L F P is less than or equal to L F Q is less than or equal to U F Q, which is less than or equal to U F P. Okay. And so the, the let, let's kind of point out these inequalities here. I think that this is worth doing right now. Uh, this one is trivial, right? So this one is just part one. I didn't use Roman numerals, so let's just do it like that. So that's part one, right? It says LFQ is always less than UFQ. Uh, oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, I do actually want refinements. Thank you. Given any two partitions, P and Q, where P is a subset of Q, thank you. And yeah, so what this says, very good catch. This says that refinements cause the lower sum to increase. Uh, increase the lower sum. Right? And then the other side is that refinements decrease the upper sum. Okay? So when you take refinements, the upper sums get lower. And when you take refinements, the lower sums get bigger, right? And again, this is kind of makes sense. The lower sum is supposed to be an under approximation. So if we refine, the approximation should get better. But if you're under approximating, getting better means that your approximation increases. If you over approximate, getting a better approximation means that your approximation should probably decrease, right? It should actually converge to what the proper number is. So that's what this one says. And then number three is uh, where you truly have arbitrary. So if P and Q are partitions, no, nope, that's not a fancy enough P. Yeah, we'll say that's close. Then LFP is less than UFQ. Okay. So uh, for this one, it says, yeah, it doesn't matter what partitions you take, whether they're refinements of each other or not, the lower sums are always less than the upper sums, right? So you could have, you know, a hyper refined upper sum um, partition and a, you know, really coarse lower sum partition, and it makes no, no difference. Uh, the upper sum will always be less uh, or always be bigger than the lower sum, right? So even as the upper sums come down, it doesn't matter how far down you make them go, they will never jump beneath any lower sum, right? The worst lower sum will still be, uh, or, or even the, the biggest upper sum will always be less than the lowest upper sum. Right? They just they can't pass each other at all. Okay. So the proof of one and three aren't too bad. The proof of two is a little bit long. It is, but it's really just a consequence of two. But you can, if you want, think about it as a wider version. Alternatively, two is again, it's telling you a little bit more than that. Um, two is again telling you about how refinements behave right, that refinements cause the lower sum to increase and the upper sum to decrease. That's really what we want to take from two. But you can think of three as just kind of like a wider generalization of that. But th three doesn't necessarily tell us the same information that two does. So in some sense, it is also different. But we're going to use two to prove three. And that proof is very, very simple. Two is the only one here that's actually really nasty. And it really depends on how much work you want to do. I think I could easily convince you that two is correct, but if you all want the super rigorous proof, I'll do it. So let's prove one first, and then you, you can vote on whether or not you want me to do the super rigorous proof or not. 
Um, so one, I'm going to write down, this is trivial. Remember, what are we trying to prove? We're trying to prove the lower sum is less than or equal to the upper sum. We're using the same partition, right? So the widths of the subintervals are the same. So we just need to prove that the lower sum has smaller rectangles than the upper sum. But that's the same thing as saying the inf is less than the soup. And that's always true, right? So this is quote unquote trivial since the infimum is always less than or equal to the supremum on the same interval, right? So LFP. And again, the only difference between these two things is that over here we have, and I hope you'll let me be lazy because I don't want to write in the interval a million times. I guess I should. No, no, I've decided I'm going to be lazy. If you want to write it in, you can. Right? And critical to this is the fact that the delta xi's are the same because we're dealing with the same partition. So all we need to do is look at the thing in the square brackets. The inf is always less than or equal to the soup. So we're done. OK, it's bugging me. I got to put it in. OK, it's going to, I'm going to put it in. It's going to be messy because my ink is a little fat, but you know what should be there, I hope. All right? All right, now with two, I can I should be able to convince you very, very easily that it's true. So the only question is whether you want the full rigorous proof um, or not. So I can kind of, con like I said, I can convince you with a very quick argument and then you can imagine yourself. And then if you want, I'll give you the, the outline of the rigorous proof or I can just do the rigorous proof. So what do you want? Because the rigorous proof is quite, quite long. It's just kind of a pain. Outline? Sure. So let me let me give you, the, yeah, okay, let me give you the outline. So first, let me convince you of just like the, the basic argument, right? So here's sort of the basic thing that we're going to do. So let's, you know, take P to be the trivial partition, right? So it's the partition that just has the, the two endpoints. There's no cut points in between. And then let's take Q to be a refinement. A, C, B. So we're just going to choose some point inside of the partition and we're going to cut it. Um, now, what I want to say is, so again, the, the middle inequality, uh, if you look at the top of the screen where I've kind of written under, you know, the under curly brace, I say that middle one is trivial by part one, right? So we don't need to prove that one. So we only need to prove that LFP is less than or equal to LFQ and that UFQ is less than or equal to LFP. The proofs for both are almost identical. You just change infant soup and the, the inequality. So let's just do it for UFP, okay? Uh, maybe I should, yeah, actually, you know what? Maybe let me, let me maybe write that down so that when you look at your notes later, you're not like, what? What are we doing? Okay, so uh, that LFQ is less than or equal to UFQ is part one. So we need to show that LFP is less than or equal to LFQ and UFQ is less than or equal to UFP. The proofs are pretty much the same. So I'm just going to do, let's say UFQ is less than or equal to UFP. So the proofs are similar. OK, so here's the basic idea. Let's just see kind of what happens when I add a refinement. So the first thing I'm going to do is just take the trivial partition, AB, and then I'm just going to refine it by sticking in a single point. And here, the critical thing to remember if a is a subset of B, then the soup of A is less than or equal to the soup of B, right? So when you take a supremum over a bigger set, you generally will get bigger things 
right? Um, and that A lesson, that A subset or equal to B won't be for the partitions. Even though P here is, uh, or Q here is our five inch of P, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about when we take the soup of F of X. So if I have U, F, P, well, P here is just the trivial partition, right? So this is going to be the soup of F of X, where X is in A, B times B minus A, right? Because P is, in this case, the trivial partition is just the endpoints A and B. So we take the supremum of the function over the entire interval and multiply it by the length of the interval B minus A. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, that is the same thing. Uh, times, uh, which do I want to do here? So C minus A plus the soup of F of X. X and A, B times B minus C. Right? So all I really did there is basically add and subtract C from the uh, to the B minus A portion and then distribute it out. So again, you can collect together. So I didn't change the soup portion at all on the right-hand side of the equal sign. All I did was add and subtract a C term to the B minus A, so to the length of the interval. And now I am going to use the fact that the supremum over the entire interval is going to be greater than or equal to the supremum over each of its subintervals. And that is just UFQ. Right? So I've proven it in this very special case. And that's basically just the idea is that as I cut up, the supremums will get smaller, right? Because I'm taking the supremum over smaller subintervals. And because I'm taking the supremum over smaller subintervals, but the total length, right, the sum length of all the intervals doesn't change, the whole, uh, the, the upper sum itself is going to get smaller overall. So does that make sense? Does everyone understand what happened there? Like, you know, we can even just draw a picture if it helps. You know, maybe here's the function. Uh, no, let, let's make a very clear uh, maximum. Right? So in the first case, what do we do? In the first case, we take just the biggest, you know, we take the soup of the whole function, and that's our rectangle. Then if I add a cut somewhere, let's say I add the cut here, well, then the next time I compute the upper sum, it looks like this. Right? So sure, one of those rectangles does have the same height, but the other rectangle actually is going to be smaller because now that I'm taking the supremum over a smaller set, um, generally the soup's going to get smaller, right? So the, the red rectangles are smaller than the one big green rectangle. And the reason for that is just we're taking soups over smaller sets. So does that make sense? Like that, that argument is to why this works? Everyone's okay with that? Okay. All right. So here's the outline of how you do the super rigorous one. This is a good exercise to try and do. Number one, by induction, on the order of Q, show that if P is the trivial partition and Q is a refinement, then UFQ is less than UFP. And as far as I'm concerned, you don't even really need to use induction for this question. You can just do it directly. And basically, the only difference between, uh, or maybe I should say this is the outline here, just so we clearly label it. 
the only difference that you're going to make is that you have to make sure that there are n sums. So instead of breaking it into, you know, in, in the proof that I did above, instead of taking it from UFP and then splitting it into two sums, you're going to break it into n sums, right? And that's it. And you can do that by induction if you want, or as far as I'm concerned, you could just do it directly um, and just say, listen, I know that Q has n partition points. Let's just you know, introduce this telescoping sequence over the uh, interval portion and then apply the supremum portion, right? That's it. So that's pretty easy. Uh, number two, uh, this, this part is trivial. So this, this step, we need it, but you know, it's very easy to prove. So show that if P is a partition of AC, and Q is a partition of CB, then P union Q is a partition of AB. And U, F, P union Q is U, F, P plus U, F, Q. Okay, there's nothing to do there. Literally just write out the definition of what each of those things is and you'll see that it works out. So what we're saying is, and pay co close attention to the intervals here, right? We're saying if um, P partitions the interval AC and then Q partitions the interval from C to B, then smushing those two things together, taking their union isn't a refinement of either of them because they're not both partitions of the same interval. But what I'm saying is partition one interval, partition the interval right beside it, if you smush those together, it is a partition of the whole interval. And moreover, um, the upper sum on the whole thing is the sum of the upper sums, right? Does that make sense? Is everyone okay with that? I can draw a picture if it helps, um, if that doesn't make sense, but you know, let me know. Sure. Okay, so here's the idea. So you've got the interval A here, you've got the interval C, and then you've got the point B, and you've got uh, some sort of function, whatever. Looks like this. Okay, <clears throat> so you've got a partition P, right? So P is the green partition, and then uh, red is the partition Q. So hopefully you can see just kind of by inspection, if you take all the green and red points together, maybe let me point out that C is both red and green, right? So if you combine the red and green things, you get a partition for the whole interval AB, right? Um, so that's the first thing. Why do we want to show two? You'll see it when I tell you what step three is. Um, so does everyone agree with that, first of all, right? Like that if you take all the green points and all the red points, that that actually does form a whole per, a partition of all of the interval AB. Yeah? That's good. Okay, now let's draw the upper sum on P. And so the upper sum on P looks something like Okay, and now I'm going to draw the upper sum on Q. No, I don't think so. Um, so no, I think that's going to be over. Okay, and again, there's kind of this divide here, right? Where this is on the left hand side is the upper sum of P, and the right hand side is the upper sum of Q. But what I want you to think about is if I took right the union of the green and the red points, and I said now take an upper sum over their union what would it look like? Well, it looks just exactly like this, right? Because in fact, the only point where the, the partitions of P and Q touch is C, but they, you know, when you do the upper sums over each part, C is the right endpoint of the P partitions and is the left endpoint of the Q partitions. They don't really interact with each other. So when you take the upper sum over their union, it really is just the upper sum of the left-hand side plus the upper sum of the right-hand side. So does that make sense? Do we see like, geometrically, visually, why this proof is true. Um, and that you basically just have to 
write down the math that corresponds to this picture. Everyone's good? No problem. OK, cool. So now, now that you have that, and like I said, that one's not really not too hard to prove. Um, it maybe looks a little bit scarier than it is, but you know, when you start writing it down, I think it's not too bad. So step three is to do the following. So let now P and Q be arbitrary. Right, because before P was uh, the trivial partition. And what I want you to do is the following. So define QI to be Q intersect XI minus one XI. So that QI is a partition or uh, yeah, so define QI is a partition of XI minus one XI and a refinement of P sub I, which we're just gonna take to be the trivial partition of that interval. All right, also Q is going to be the union over i equals one to the order of p, q i, and p is going to be the union from i equals one to the order of p of p i, right? So basically, what I've done, what we're going to do in this step is we're going to say, look at the partition p and look at each subinterval it defines. And then we're going to define that interval, uh, we're going to take the trivial partition of that to be p i, and then we're going to take the points of Q that are in there to be QI, okay? Uh, and then the proof here is just, well, UFP is equal to, or sorry, let's start with UFQ, maybe that's easier. UFQ is equal to the sum from I equals one to the order of P of UFQI, uh, which is always going to be on each interval less than or equal to, by two uh, and by one and two. Or actually, I guess this is this right here. This is part two. This is part one. And this is part two again. And you're done. Uh, the XI, yeah, that's a good question, I guess. I should be more clear about that. The XI are from P. You're right. I should have been more clear about that. Okay. So again, kind of in terms of what we're doing here. So let me draw the P's in green. So this is X naught. It's like X1, it's like X2, here's X4. And now uh, the green thing is a refine, or, or uh, sorry, the red Q is gonna be a refinement. So maybe that's the P's. So the Q's are gonna look something like this. All right, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna say, okay, Let's focus in on this interval right here. We're going to take P1 to just be X naught X1. And then we're going to take Q1 to be these points, whatever they are, right? These are the things that are in Q1. Now we are in the case of step one, right? Where we have a refinement of the trivial partition. And so that tells us that on this subinterval, U F P one is, or let's do Q, is less than or equal to U F P one, right? And you just do that for each of the partitions. Uh, and then by part two, you know that you can just add all these up together and you'll get the 
the global uh, upper sum for uh, over uh, all of Q and the global upper sum for over all of P. Does that make sense? Okay. So you're basically just breaking it down. Because again, here's kind of the problem is like, well, how do you deal? The, the rough idea, the basic outline is that as you take the supremum over smaller sets, the supremum gets smaller. But if you want to rigorously like write all this out, how do you do that? Because you don't know how Q refines P. Does it just add a single cut point? Does it add two cut points? Does it add 50 cut points? So you just argue if you have a trivial partition, it, it doesn't matter how many, how you refine it, that will be, um, the refinement will decrease in size. And then when you actually do the arbitrary partitions, just sort of inductively do it uh, for each subinterval defined by P and take the trivial partition there. So this is, in my opinion, probably the easiest way to do this, um, but it does involve a little bit of work to, to formalize the language, okay? But you can see here, step three is actually not even an outline. Step three is literally the proof of step three. Step two, is a little bit of work. It's not, it shouldn't be terribly long. It's probably like three or four lines. It's not too bad. And step one, again, should be two or three lines. So altogether, it's not a crazy amount. But I think if you see maybe the full rigorous proof, you kind of get, again, you lose the forest for the trees. And uh, it's maybe just easier to see and compartmentalize each portion and believe that, yeah, you could probably reconstruct each portion if you needed to. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, behind the fully rigorous proof. Okay. Uh, and then finally, so that that is actually the, only the proof of uh, number two here. So we still have to prove number three. I maybe should have called these something different because um, now I'm confusing it with the outline. So maybe let me change these just to like Roman numerals just so that we don't confuse it with the outline. Okay, so now this is the... You know, this here is one. You don't have to do this if you think you can keep it straight. Right? I just didn't want to confuse uh, these numbers in the outline with the numbers in the other part. And that's right, exactly. And this whole, yeah, that's only the upper sum, but the lower sum is pretty much the exact same, right? So again, if you look at the lower sum, uh, the, the proof of, for example, this basic idea is exactly the same thing. Only when you take infimums, infimum actually switches the signs, right? So if A is a subset of B, uh, generally the infimum of A will be bigger than or equal to the infimum of B. So the, the sign changes from a less than or equal to a greater than or equal to. And then everywhere here, uh, when you change the soup to an inf, you just switch the signs. And so basically the proof is identical. Change the U's for the upper sum to L's for the lower sum change soups to imps and change less than or equal to greater than or equal to and the proof is identical, right? So that's why we're only doing the upper sum proof because the lower sum proof is, is literally the exact same just by making the appropriate changes, okay? And then three, so if you remember what three says, three says, you know, choose two arbitrary partitions. The lower sums are always less than the upper sums, but there isn't much to do here. So we say let P and Q be arbitrary. and P union Q be their refinement. So, well, what did we just show? Right, and, uh, oops, sorry, UFQ. And if you ignore everything in the middle, that's exactly what we wanted to prove. And that proves everything. All right, so that's a, that's a cool little trick. Um, this idea of taking common refinements, you remember back when we were doing limits and epsilon delta limits and we'd say like, you know, take the minimum of delta one and delta two. That's basically what refinements is going to do for us. 
Um, we wanted kind of both things to be true simultaneously when we were doing limits. So we'd say, oh, look, there's a delta one, which makes this epsilon work. There's a delta two, which makes this epsilon work. Let delta be the minimum of delta one and delta two. That's basically what a common refinement is going to be for us here, right? Uh, you know that the partition P works for this thing. You know the partition Q works for this thing. Take their union to get this new partition, uh, which refines both of the previous things. And refinements are generally going to make things better, not worse. So just like, you know, uh, when we're doing epsilon deltas, you could always take a smaller delta, right? If you found a delta that works, a smaller delta is even better. So here, same sort of thing. We've got a partition P which works, partition Q which works. Refining partitions make things better, not worse. So the common refinement is basically going to be the same thing as taking the minimum of our two deltas to guarantee that both things are true simultaneously. OK? So are there any questions about that proof? You might need to run through it on your own. Um, I think one of the things that you're going to see here as part of these uh, Riemann or, or integration proofs, integration proofs are kind of, they're usually longer than epsilon delta proofs uh, from like differential calculus, but they're in some sense easier. It's just that there's more you know, machinery that you have to play with. So the proofs are longer, but in some sense easier. Um, and I would, again, encourage you to go back and look at this proof in a couple of days and uh, see if you can do it yourself, right? And importantly, don't look at the proof that we did in class, but make sure that you can reconstruct this on your own, because these are fairly basic things. But until you get used to them, right, they might seem foreign. And this is a great exercise to actually get used to it. Okay. Well, so this says, again, to us that... Uh, when we take refinements, lower sums get bigger and upper sums get smaller. And basically what we want to be able to argue is that something has a well-defined area under the curve if these two things eventually go and match up to each other, sort of like a squeeze theorem sort of thing, right? The upper sums, we take better and better refinements of our partitions. The lower sums get or start coming down, the lower sums start coming up, and eventually they should hit each other. And if they hit each other, that's sort of like the best that you can do, because we know that the upper sums are always bigger than the lower sums. So if eventually they can kind of like asymptotically touch each other, then that has to be the area, right? The upper sums always also an over approximation, the lower sums always an under approximation. If those two ever touch, that is the area under the curve, right? But, but, and here's kind of the important point. Finding the area under a curve is brutally, brutally hard, right? That's the entire point of developing the theory of integral calculus. Um, you know, you can find the area of a rectangle, sure. A triangle, yeah, probably. But the moment things start to have curves in them, even like circles, circles are hard. Basically, I think it was Archimedes who discovered the formula for the area of a circle. Dude pretty much used integration in order to do that, right? If you look at his original proof, he was effectively doing an integral. So the moment you don't have straight lines, uh, things, and, and, and you can't reduce things to rectangles and triangles, the moment you have curves, things become really, really hard. So the last thing that you want to do when you're developing a theory of integrals is require that you figure out what the area of something is uh, in order to prove that it has an area. Do you know what I mean? Like computing areas is hard. We'd really prefer not to have to compute an area in order to figure um, it out. Uh, maybe let me put this a different way. When we were trying to prove that limits existed, you needed to know what the limit was, right? When I said prove that the limit as x approaches four of x squared is 16, you had to know what the 16 was, right? And that's fine, computing limits isn't that hard in the grand scheme of things. You could have guessed that x squared approached 16 as x approached four. But now if I give you some nasty curve, and I say, prove, you know, to figure out what the integral of this is. You, you don't know how to do that, right? That's the entire point of us developing this theory. So we really, really, really don't want a definition of the integral, at least at the beginning, that requires us to know what the area should be. So that's why we're going to use the following. Um, so definition. So uh, if f from a, b to r is bounded, uh, how do I want to say this? 
uh, we say that f is integral, integrable. That f is integrable if for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a partition P, and this is this is a beautiful, beautiful uh, definition for this reason, uh, such that So I've said this is true. Okay. And we're going to add a little bit more to this definition, but I want you to think right now about what this is saying. This says, because again, we always know that the upper sums are bigger than the lower sums, right? But it says that I can get them to be arbitrarily close together, right? In, in, in my head, I kind of have the following picture, right? Here's kind of my number line, only I've drawn it vertically. Well, delta is now, it's kind of hidden in the partition, right? The partition is kind of, right? Normally it'd be for every epsilon there exists a delta. The delta is kind of there, but it's the partition is now the delta. And if you do Riemann sums, you, there's explicitly a delta. A delta actually does show up. Um, and it's that the length of the partition has to be less than delta. But the delta is hidden in the partition. Right, that's the, that's the idea of where it where it is. So it's it's effectively the same definition. It's just the delta is kind of hidden. So we know again the idea is you know you you've got this number. This is secretly the area. We don't know what it is, but we know secretly we hope it exists. And the upper sums are uh, above it. They're always upper approximations, right? And the lower sums are always under approximations. And again, we want to argue that they have to come together. Well, how can I say that they come together without knowing what they approach? Well, one thing that I can say is that I can always find a partition which makes these two things get arbitrarily close together. Do you know what I mean? Like if, if uh, there are two people on either sides of the glass, but both of them can touch it, how do you say that? Well, without kind of like talking about the glass. Well, you say, look, I can make them get as close to the glass as possible. I can, they can get as close to each other as possible. Right, there's still a glass pane there keeping these two people separated, but you know, you if you can get them to stand as close together as you want, then you can basically make them touch. Right, that's the idea. So does that make sense? Does everyone see why this definition is the same thing as saying that these two things come together? Is everyone okay with that? Okay. Okay. So in this case. So we're going to add to this definition. So in this case, i.e. in the case where you're integrable, there is a distinguished, there is a unique number called the integral of f. And the way that it, this is denoted is just like this. So this is going to be a curly like F or a curly S sort of thing. Uh, well, what is N there, there though, Adam, right? Like the length of the partition or the number of, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. In that sense, you can think about this as a limit in the same sense as that, right? Where you're sort of like saying, um, generally the partitions that you're gonna take how do you guarantee that you get better and better approximations is by taking bigger and bigger refinements, which is the same thing as taking it bigger and bigger orders. So if you want to think about it like that, yeah, that absolutely works. So it's denoted the integral of f like this. Some of you are freaking out because you've seen an integral notation before and you're like, that's not how we denoted it. I'll talk about that in a second. So in this case, there is a unique number called the integral of f denoted with this sign such that Uh, a couple of things. One, LFP is less than or equal to the integral of F is less than or equal to UFP for all P. And two, uh, it turns out, if you want to compute this explicitly, that the integral of F is the supremum over all partitions of the lower sums and that 
equivalently is the infimum over all partitions of the upper sums. Which if you think about it is like, oh man, that's getting a little complicated because the lower sums are defined using infimums and we're taking the supremum over all the things that have infimums and we're taking the supremum over all possible partitions. So we're taking soups of imps and on the right hand side, we're taking imps of soups and it all seems very, very complicated. Um, but in either case, if you actually then want the integral, right? So this definition is the definition of integrability in the same way that we talked about differentiability. And there's a difference between differentiability and the derivative. Here we're talking about integrability and then the integral, right? And uh, the definition of integrability does not require knowing what the integral is. But if you can, uh, if you're interested in it, this is uh, how you'd actually find it. So you can either find the unique number, which is always between the uh, lower and upper sums, all of them, or you can take the supremum of the lower sums and the infimum of the upper sums. Okay, now in practice, this is not a good way to compute integrals, right? So from a theoretical viewpoint, we're going to talk about what integration is. Um, we're not going to compute integrals because this is not how you want to do it. I'll do an example of how you would compute an integral this way, and you'll see, yeah, this is a nightmare. Um, and then eventually we'll get to something called the fundamental theorem of calculus, which will tell us how a much better way of computing integrals. Okay, uh, let me talk a little bit about notation here because again, some of you are probably upset with notation. Okay, so first of all, um, does two imply one? Yeah, they're the same thing. Yeah, in, in, the, in the case of integrability, two and one are the same thing. So I'm, I'm going to prove this next time just because I don't have time to do it, but I will prove the implications that there does exist this unique number which does this. Um, for notation, note a couple things. One, the integral of f is totally unambiguous. Right? Uh, you know what the domain of the function is. You know what the function is. If you write this down, you know what the integral is. Uh, so this is completely and totally unambiguous. So this is mathematically how real mathematicians write down the integral. However, if any of you have seen the integral before, and we will also use this notation in class, what you sometimes also see is this. This is kind of the classic notation, right? Don't ask me what the dx is. It's way too hard to explain. But again, this kind of keeps track of the domain of integration as well, because f was defined on the interval a, b. Um, so that's kind of nice. Uh, there's also, you can see this. You could see this. Okay. And technically these are different, but for us right now, they're not. Um, so later we're going to see that, that uh, these two and this are actually, they mean different things, but right now they actually mean the same thing. Um, so these are other notations that some people sometimes use. Um, what we absolutely cannot do, this is not the same, is we cannot write this. Okay, this means something else. Okay, so don't write that down. And you, you might be upset. You might be like, yeah, no, I should be able to write that down. Why is it that I can put the f of x dx when I include the domain of integration, but our original notation didn't include the x dx or the domain of integration? Uh, why can't I take this half measure? Just convention. It means something else. Okay. So these four things that are written on the left are all equivalent. They all mean the same thing for us right now. If you write these down, there's no issue. The thing on the right is something else. Don't write it down. Exactly. It's an indefinite integral. We need to talk about what that means, but it's going to be a little bit of time before we get there, right? Um, but those four things all mean the same thing, and so you can use them interchangeably. When you talk to your 136 friends, if you write down the first thing, the, just the integral of f, they're going to freak out. If you go on the internet and write that down, most people have not taken any real mathematics in their life, and so they're going to freak out. If you talk to an engineer or a physicist, they're going to freak out. But this is what mathematicians do. This is a real math class. This is the correct notation. Um, so just as a heads up, people are going to fight you over this. You can just say, listen, I've taken a real math class. You haven't. Go away. Um, but just as a heads up, this is, yeah, this is the correct notation. Okay? 
Because remember, dom functions have domains. None of those other people, the physicists, the Math 136 students, the engineers don't believe that's true, right? They get asked all sorts of stupid questions all the time. Here's the function, find its domain. What? That doesn't make any sense. Functions come with domains attached already, right? So you don't have to specify domain. It's built into the definition of a function. Um, so that's why they would freak out there because they don't understand functions have domains as part of their, uh, as part of their data, right? Um, so that's kind of why they're freaking out. Okay, so everyone, that's going to take care of it uh, for us today. Um, you should be able to, if you want to, find some nice like little applets online that will kind of draw upper and lower sums for you if you want. Um, it shouldn't be hard to do, just throw it into Google. I do have one, but we're out of time here. So like, uh, you know, I'll show it to you next time or something. Uh, maybe remind me though, if I don't bring it up, I'll do it first thing next time. So if I don't start with it, be like, hey, so you, you know, you said you were going to do this. Um, and yeah, that takes care of us for today. So think about that. Um, if you want as well, try and prove some very simple things are integrable and maybe even try and find their integrals. Constant function, maybe the, the function f of x equals x, that's a good one to try as well. If the domain of f is r, does the ambiguous... Okay, so notably, um, Yvonne, in our definition of you cannot integrate a function uh, whose domain is r, right? The definition at the top of the screen here requires that the domain be a closed and bounded interval a, b. So that's not allowed, right? A, a function cannot have domain r. That's a, that's a different thing that we have to talk about and it's complicated. We will talk about it eventually, but it has to be a closed and bounded domain. Can you not take an integral of an unbounded function? It, strictly speaking, no. There is, and you can extend the definition of an integral to include those functions. Um, those are called improper integrals, um, but that is a different theory. And like I said, we will talk about it, but we have to build up to it. So we need to understand integrals pretty well before we can say, hey, if we want to generalize this to unbounded functions or functions with an unbounded domain, how do we do that? How do we make sense of that? Um, but no, strictly speaking, if you want to integrate a function, it has to be bounded and it has to, the domain itself also has to be bounded. Uh, there's a sense in which we can say that uh, some, even an unbounded function might have a finite area under its curve. There is a, there is a way that we can do that. And I'll show you, right? Like we don't have to guess. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'll show you all how to do that. Uh, so we integrate a function on an interval does not exist, like there's only integration on its domain. Strictly speaking, yes. I mean, again, even we will kind of abuse notation a little bit and say, hey, look, I've got a function, here's its domain, but what happens if I integrate it on a smaller domain? Or we might take a look at a function which is defined on all of the real numbers and just say, hey, listen, I understand that this function is not integrable on the entire real line, um, but I, it is integrable on any closed and bounded domain that I choose. And we're, we're, you'll see it. When we get to it, you'll see it. Um, so we will abuse that notation, just like the engineers and the physicists and the 136 students do. But strictly speaking, you have to be really careful, really technical, and always make sure that your function is just defined on a closed and bounded domain. Yeah. 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 Again, like some people do change domains of the functions or extend the domains of the functions. And strictly speaking, you can do that and it's technical and uh, it requires a little bit of work. Um, and then most of the time you just forget about it and not worry about it. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Like when we talk about additivity of domain and things like that. Okay, everyone. All right, so there's a lot that happened here. Take some time to try and synthesize and, and uh, like I said, get a grasp on it. Again, really good exercise right now would be try and prove the constant function is integrable and find its integral. Try and prove the function f of x equals x is integrable on whatever domain you want, it doesn't matter, and find its integral. It's obviously just a triangle, but nonetheless, um, see if you can do it from this definition, right? Don't use just the area of a triangle, try and prove that you get the right area. Um, and those will be really good exercises and we'll see when we come back on Thursday, I will do f of x equals x for you. Um, and then you can see how I did it and it'll be nice to see if uh, any of you came up with something different, okay? All right, so I'll see you all on Thursday. Uh, yeah, have a good uh, couple of days and I'll see you then.